Very happy to be here. I already had some great conversations over breakfast. First thing I want to say, though, is that this is not an official NASA presentation. It's going to be a little more freewheeling than my typical government scientist talk. But what I wanted to do today um, is talk about, you know, I started working in climate change about a decade ago. Uh, and what I thought when I started in it was what we were trying to do was to kind of figure out what the worst case scenario was and to put things like error bounds on it so society could do planning. Like literally, like you could say, oh, well, sea level rise will be within this range. And then people planning infrastructure can think about what kind of risk they could tolerate to think about where to put schools or a power plant or a water treatment facility. But as I've watched the way that the climate change debate has gone in the media and in politics and even amongst people, like you know, a good friend of mine who's an engineer and a fighter pilot, he said, listen, Tom, you know, I accept that CO2 is going up. It's warming the planet, and we caused it. But come on, you know, the planet's going to warm up a little bit. What's the big deal? It's not like the world's going to end. And what I realized was I think that by focusing on the kind of catastrophist view, you know, like, oh my gosh, in the future it's going to be like this, we may have made a mistake. And that really what we, we kind of created this thing like there's some silver bullet for this, or it's this vague existential threat that's off in the future. And what I think we need to do is focus on the fact that climate change is happening right now, and it's going to continue to go on. But there are challenges we're facing right now. What I'm hopeful is that if we focus on those challenges, we can start to generate the social will to deal with the long term. But anyhow, so today, I want to talk a little bit about the Earth as a system and what we know about it and how we understand it. And then I want to get into the changes going on today to draw from those about how we can approach climate change and the impacts from it. I know of no better way to think about the Earth system than through a 1970s stereo, because it has knobs all over the place. In this case, the Panasonic R7576D with field effect transistors. Now, I know we're in Austin, and you guys are all into vinyl and tube amps, but I can tell you that when these came out, finally the rest of us could get a stereo, and you didn't need air conditioning for it. But just to understand, right? CO2 is the big knob on the Earth system. And think about, instead of music coming out of the speakers, think about the temperature of the planet as the music, OK? The biggest knob is CO2 affecting that temperature. But there's a whole bunch of other knobs. A lot of the research that you hear about, and the media is great. They basically, as soon as a new research paper comes out, you guys hear about it, sometimes even before the research comes out. Our research is focused on how these different knobs affect the music or that temperature. Where it gets complicated is a lot of these knobs are interrelated. Like, you turn up CO2, you melt permafrost, you release more methane, which is a very potent greenhouse forcer, you drive temperature. Where it gets complicated, and here's where the debate really lies in climate change projections. You turn up CO2, you put more moisture in the atmosphere, maybe you make more clouds. Maybe those clouds reflect sunlight back into space, although it gets complicated because low clouds can hold heat near the Earth's surface. Um, but I don't want you to lose sight of one thing, which is this, right? We are cranking the CO2 knob so much that we have ACDC blasting through the speakers right now. <laughs> and the planet is getting so warm, and there's so much CO2 going in the atmosphere that we're literally returning to dinosaur times. Why I say that is this. We currently, you know, we're pushing three, 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. We're talking about, within the next few decades, getting up to 600, 800, towards the end of the century, maybe 1,000 or 1,200. We had CO2 contents of the atmosphere like that 65 million years ago, when there were dinosaurs in Antarctica and in the Arctic. There were forests, and it was a subtropical environment with reefs and sharks and things. We're doing many tens of millions of years of change to this planet right now just by turning that CO2 knob. One of the other things we're doing is we are turning the ocean into the soda water that is in your refrigerator. Literally, there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere, it's dissolving into the ocean. It's making the ocean more acidic. These are coccolithophores, right? They're one of the phytoplankton, these microorganisms that live near the ocean's surface. They are the basis for the food chain. They do things like produce oxygen. Ocean's getting so acidic, they can't secrete their, their shells anymore, and they're dissolving and going away, OK? The other thing, too, is that there's tremendous physical change happening to the planet. One of the best manifestations of those is the Arctic sea ice cap. So this is a map of the Arctic. You can see Russia off to the left, Europe off to the top right, North America down here. 
In between is an ocean that's usually covered with ice. We have literally lost three quarters of the ice that used to be there in the 80s. Okay, think about that for a second. Let that sink in. People that are oceanographers, they talk about the Arctic spinning up as a new ocean. Like literally, what's happening now is that as you take that ice away, wind can blow across the ocean surface and mix it. It used to be really stratified. Also too, we're losing so much ice from places like Greenland and Alaska. We are raising sea level around the world by 1.5 millimeters a year, just from that ice that's on land going in the ocean. Tremendous changes, okay? All right, now here's a question. How do we project forward? You've probably heard of things like the IPCC report. And what they recommend is an amazingly complicated set of models where they take an economic model to look at how much CO2 is gonna come out. They do things like then take an ocean model, an atmospheric model, an ice model, and they numerically pull all this stuff together to project what the planet will be like. It's complicated, there's uncertainties, but if you're ever bored, you know, go and take a look at just how much work they put into these models and you'll be amazed. But here's what I'm gonna say for a minute. Let's just ditch the modeling. Don't even think about 50 years out, forget 100 years out. Let's just look at what's going on today and extrapolate from that. This is not a projection, this is data. And if you've never seen it, and if you're on the computer right now, look up the National Climate Assessment. Every few years, all the federal agencies, including NASA, get together and they literally map out all the changes that have already occurred in the US, okay? It's not a huge projection, it's what's going on now. And you can see that temperatures have gone up by almost a couple of degrees almost everywhere in the US. I'm trying to tailor this talk too to people who work in the power industry and are thinking about water and energy in general. I don't have to tell you that this obviously means all kinds of things for things like air conditioning and power resources. But what you have to understand is that it's also made, it has tremendous impacts on things like our ecosystems. Now things are starting to bloom earlier in the year, but they might be out of sync with the life cycle of other organisms. Crops, in some ways it's good, they may have a longer growing season, but one of the things we gotta worry about is that, whoa, is it gonna get too hot for those crops? Oops, sorry. It doesn't like my California slide. Maybe because we're in Texas. The, okay, so the California drought went on for about five years, worst drought in the state's history, okay? Guess what, that drought probably wasn't caused by climate change may have been natural variation, may have simply been caused by some changes in the Pacific Ocean, right? But that drought is profoundly important for us because it's telling us what's gonna happen down the road. We expect more of those kinds of droughts. Let's just think about what the impacts were. Well, as a start, some towns dried up. They literally didn't have water anymore. On top of that, we had fires all across the state, and overall, 25% of the trees died. Okay? And we're not talking about going to a forest and one in four trees. What we're talking about is vast tracts losing all their trees. Also, too, the state was forced to mine a lot of its groundwater. So literally, the groundwater tables have all dropped. Okay? Now, fortunately, this drought is over. But what I want you to think about is this. It was so severe that when things come back, they will look different. Different ecosystems, but also the economic landscape may look pretty different. This is also from the National Climate Assessment. We've had dramatic changes in precipitation over the last 30, 40 years, okay? This is a map showing you the change in intense precipitation, like those 1% events. Take a look at the northeastern US, right? We have a 71% increase in events with very, very hard precipitation. What does that do? It causes flooding, it impacts infrastructure, right? What's the cause of this? It's actually pretty straightforward. You warm the atmosphere up, you can hold more water in it, when you do things like have that water and touch a cold air mass coming down from the Arctic, boom, you have more precipitable water, so you get a higher impact. Man, okay. One of the other huge impacts, right? Rising sea levels around the world are already impacting people. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the city of Miami. This is the occurrence of flooding events in Miami going back from 1996 to 2014 from Shaman Widowski at University of Miami. If you look back at like 1996 to 2002, you see a lot of blue, and that's flooding associated with rain. You also see some brown associated with storm events, right? But look what happens as we get to the to like 20, 2010, 2012, we see all that green. That is flooding associated with tidal events. That's literally the ocean waters just coming up and flooding Miami. 
It's so severe, and this article's written about this in newspapers, in magazines, and things, that they're having to develop new pumping systems to try to keep the water from flooding the streets. Okay, right now around the world, sea level's rising by three millimeters a year. It's only increasing. It's also gotten so bad at NASA centers, like Kennedy Space Center, They've had to make a map of the center and decide what land they know they're going to lose that they can't build on, and they try to preserve things like the launch pads that they want to use going into the future. Okay. This is from a colleague, Eric Fernandez, at the World Bank. One of the things that Eric is working on is he's trying to look at how developing countries are going to be impacted by warming, and particularly he's looking at cash crops. This is coffee-producing areas of Colombia. The take-home point is you should run screaming from the room right now and get your last cup of coffee. <laughs> but this is 2014. The, if you see the red, those are the areas of Colombia. Oh, I do have a laser pointer. These are the areas of Colombia where you can grow coffee right now. As the planet warms up and we get to 2050, look what happens to those areas, right? They shrink. Now, I want you to put on your business person hat for a minute, OK? Think this through. Now, you're probably going, oh, well, Tom, we're just going to grow coffee in another part of the world. OK. So what does that mean? In this other part of the world, you have to clear the land. You've got to find a coffee tree that's adapted to those soils and that climate. You've got to have an educated workforce that can do it. And now you need the infrastructure to move everything in and out. Think about the disruption to that industry. OK, but now let's have it not just be coffee. Let's think about all kinds of cash crops. Let's think about big crops like wheat. Okay? This is the kind of stuff that we need to worry about going forward. And that's why I put this slide in, and I have data in my title. Does Anybody know what this is? <laughs> right. So half of you probably said urinal and said, why is he showing us a toilet fixture? And I hope half of you said fantastic piece of art, right? It was supposed to do double duty. One of the things, if you want to learn about how the Earth works as a system, there's a great book by Richard Alley called Earth, the Operator's Manual. And one of the things Richard points out is that maybe we should think about CO2 the way we thought about sewage. That was a big impact for society, but we generated the willpower and the capital to deal with it. But just about 100 years ago, Marcel Duchamp and the Dadaists started exhibiting objects like this, what are called ready-mades. Um, these are things that they submitted to art festivals, and it caused all kinds of controversy and debate. Okay? But it changed the way we look at art, and even the way we still look at it today. I think we need to have a similar change in how we look at climate change. Again, I think what's happened is we've made it look like it's something that's kind of far off in the future, that, you know, it's almost like a superhero-style existential threat. When, in fact, it's going on right now. And I'm hopeful that maybe if we start to focus on the near term, that we can start to generate some of the social will to deal with the long term. I think a perfect example of this comes from sea level rise. And this is one of the things that's near and dear to my heart. This is what I spend most of my time working on. We put a lot of time into figuring out how much sea level will rise in the next 100 years. Again, right now it's rising three millimeters a year. We predict anywhere from one to three feet of sea level rise based on our detailed numerical models. Those numerical models do not include things like dynamic change. Like, for example, we've recently realized that part of Antarctica is starting to lift up and could dump into the ocean very quickly. There's a paper that just came out that suggested, hey, maybe it's going to be more like 10 feet and not 5 feet. Let's just stick with the three-foot number for right now, which is relatively, like I say, it's conservative. If you raise sea level by three feet around the world, you displace 145 million people and you do trillions of dollars of economic damage. You say, OK, well, maybe those people could all move. Well, let's look at the Syrian example for a minute. Just four million Syrian refugees caused how crazy of an environment, a humanitarian crisis, how awful a humanitarian crisis. It's actually even restructured the way people think about refugees and the political debate all across Europe. What we're talking about is having one Syria every four years in terms of the number of people we're moving around. And now I know you're going, OK, but Tom, they had to leave Syria because of a civil war. They had to move to another country. In the sea level rise case, maybe people could just be displaced internally. OK, but that was just sea level rise. Okay. Let's think through now what's going to happen overall on the globe. I feel like my time jumped. Anyhow, look, just quickly, I'll wrap up, right? Temperatures are going up all around the globe, OK, right now. There are not just the impacts in that it's warmer. There are also changes to regional precipitation, right? 
There's going to be changes to what kinds of crops you can grow. What we're talking about is something that may cause people to have to get on the move, and we've got to deal with it. The thing that I'm becoming more concerned with, you know, as I look at this ball, is that what's happening is that our human systems are a lot more fragile than I ever realized. You look at how ISIS was able to roll across big tracts of the world so easily. We don't deal that well with change. And what we know we have coming is continuous change. So I want to leave you with kind of three thoughts. Okay, the first one is that while climate change is a global phenomena, the impacts are highly variable and profoundly local. Depending on where you live and what industry you're in, you need to think about anything from flooding to heating to changes in crops that you can grow. The other thing is that the private sector has got a tremendous role to play here. There's a great Bob Ed piece by Pierce Sellers in the New York Times, an astronaut, where he kind of points out, and it's not just things like batteries and solar cells, it's also gonna be things like how do you deal with flooding, okay? And finally, too, I want you to understand that the planet is not just changing, it is changed. And what I'm hopeful for is that if we start to focus on the near-term change, that we can all sleep a little bit better at night because we're starting to deal with things and we can, you know, start doing our part to make sure the earth is still a great place for our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. So, Tom, just a quick yeah. question, just two lightning questions yeah. for you. Number one, if uh, 35 years from now, if you were looking for a place to live that would be uh, optimal? I get that. You know, I'll tell you something I didn't talk about. I get calls now from all sectors of the economy. Where to move? Real estate people call, insurance yeah. people call, and I say, I encourage you to go and look at the National Climate Assessment and think about it for yourself. Second question then, with the reinsurance community and how they insure insurance companies, right. what's, what's the conversation with them like? So they've already kind of cottoned onto this, yeah. right? And they are already thinking about it. I'll tell you one other really interesting thing that's happening. If you've ever heard of CubeSats, you know, these tiny like 10 centimeter on a side satellites, the entire industry is buying those. Like there's yeah. like 20 companies that do those now because what they want Sensors. is more data for themselves to get ahead of the competition. And I think we're only gonna see more of that kind of stuff incorporated into planning. I agree with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks.